introduce Professor Christopher Norris from uh, the University of Cardiff in Wales, where he's distinguished uh, research professor. Most of you will already know uh, his work, his background. Uh, he's particularly well known, perhaps, for his work on continental philosophy, Derrida in particular, but also more broadly. And several of his books are uh, revolve around that interest, uh, including the, dis the, the Deconstructive Turn, um, The Truth About Postmodernism, and a, a very recent uh, uh, contribution, um, Badiou's being, uh, being an Event, A Reader's Guide. Uh, um, and um, so, so that's one area, but he also has many other uh, areas of expertise, including philosophy of science, philosophy of language, um, and uh, so on and so forth. And today he's going to um, talk about Richard Rorty. And I, I, I think talk is perhaps a misleading term. He's going to actually present his views in the form of a poem, which is something quite uh, unique for this event. And so it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Christopher Norris. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, so, so it's, it's uh, by nature a rather sort of experimental um, presentation, um, but I, I take heart, um, I'm emboldened um, partly by the, the nature of this occasion, which has been wonderfully convivial and friendly and, uh, I mean, demanding and um, stimulating, but also very nice and enjoyable. Um, and partly by the fact that uh, Rorty himself wanted philosophy to, in some sense, come closer to poetry, uh, to be more inventive, more creative, exploratory, um, um, and partly it's, 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 um, it's one stage in a kind of ambition I have to revive a literary genre, which is that of the 18th century verse essay. So a verse form in which you can argue and put a case and um, counter objections and engage with topics in all sorts of ways, and using verse as a way partly of sparking new ideas. I think if, um, if I have to justify doing this in, in verse form, it's very tight verse form actually, it's, Rhyme scheme A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, so it's eight line stanzas, octaves. Um, a fairly strict iambic pentameter. I have tried to vary the rhythm a bit, actually, the speech rhythm, so as to, to try at points to catch Rorty's uh, very distinctive um, tone of address, which if you, you heard him at all, you'll, you'll I hope, recognize. Um, but it's, yeah, it's an attempt to revive what is really, I mean, it has quite sort of illustrious precedents, uh, going back to, well, as we heard this morning, Parmenides. But it was really the 18th century. Um, in, in, in England that uh, sort of pioneered in this way of, um, William Emerson called it arguifying. So it's not arguing in the strict sense, not, it wouldn't uh, sort of conform to strict protocols of uh, deductive argument or anything like that, but it's a way of sort of putting forward a case and um, sort of pushing it through stages of argument and using the verse form of a way, as a way of uh, giving it a bit more punch, a bit more point, and occasionally sort of negotiating turns of argument through turns of verse and using the rhyme as a, as a prompt to, to new ideas. Um, so that's what I was trying to do. It's also it's about Rorty, about Rorty's ideas. Um, it's partly anecdotal in the sense that um, I, uh, I, I started off as a, as a, did a very straight English degree, in fact, and then moved into literary theory and then got into uh, continental philosophy via Derrida as much as anything, sort of reading my way backwards into the history of philosophy, encountered Rorty, Rorty's ideas, um, partly through his book Philosophy as the Mirror of Nature, uh, which, as a literary theorist, I, I thought was a wonderful book in the sense it was saying philosophers should be more literary, they should be more inventive, they should be edifying, uh, rather than um, analytic in, in what he saw as the rather sort of hidebound sense of that term. Um, and um, the, the idea that uh, philosophy should, among other things, tell a narrative, and preferably an inventive and fairly sort of original narrative about its own development to date, so a kind of uh, what he would call naturalized Hegelianism. Um, the, the Nietzschean influence, the idea that metaphor was, uh, well, on the one hand, more central to the, the great texts of Western philosophy than philosophers had so far recognized, with some exceptions, like Nietzsche and Rorty himself. Um, and the idea that philosophy should be more inventive and that certain ways of close reading developed by literary critics and theorists might be appropriate um, as applied to the text of philosophy. So when I wrote a book called The Deconstructive Turn, which came out in 83, I really went pretty much all out for that, you know, looking in the philosophers for, for signs of a sort of narrative and poetic um, 
language and argumentative structure. And after that, uh, very shortly, uh, well, yeah, after reading a lot more of Rorty and beginning to sort of sound out the implications of his approach to, um, to those he called the great dead philosophers, I began to have doubts about it and took a rather different view. And uh, so we, we had various encounters in print and at uh, various conferences going back to 83. Um, so the, the issues in the poem really, really come out of, uh, well, no, it's a verse essay more than a poem. It's, it's not a lyrical effusion, as you'll have gathered. Um, and so have, they have to do with um, the whole question of metaphor and narrative as components of philosophical discourse. Um, the question of uh, Rorty's reading of Derrida, which is really what uh, chiefly interested me at the time. Rorty had a very selective reading of Derrida. He thought Derrida was absolutely great, you know, a real sort of tonic, if you like, to philosophy, when he was not being philosophical. Uh, Rorty thought Derrida at his best was inventive, highly metaphorical, zany, often quite sort of over the top, um, but uh, sort of inspiring in that kind of um, provocative, uh, gadfly sort of way. So, you know, an honorable tradition in philosophy. Um, but that as soon as Derrida started to talk in terms of um, logocentrism and the metaphysics of presence, and as soon as he started to do what presented themselves um, as, transcend as negative transcendental arguments about conditions of impossibility, as applied to, to Kant and to Rousseau and to Husserl, then, uh, then Rorty thought this is Derrida just falling back into bad old ways of thought, being philosophical, you know, with a capital P. So I disagreed with that. I mean, I, I thought Derrida does have distinctively philosophical transcendental arguments. Um, the poem also talks about, um, uh, about Derrida's reading of Heidegger, his famous phrase for Heidegger, that Schwarzwald Redneck. <laughs> so what his line was, Heidegger was a great thinker, a great philosopher, inspirational in philosophical terms, but he also happens to have been a card-carrying Nazi, and we just have to learn to live with that fact, just as we wouldn't change our banks, for instance, if we found out the bank manager had been a Nazi party member, therefore we should recognize that philosophers cannot be held to moral or political standards of integrity higher than those of the average citizen, um, which I found you know, unsatisfactory in various ways. Um, and it also talks a bit about uh, Rorty's politics and compares and contrasts those politics with those of sort of first generation pragmatists like, um, like William James. So um, I hope it doesn't go on too long, but it may very well. And um, if anyone, Alistair perhaps, if you feel that it's, um, it's gone on too long, then just stop me. Um, Okay, poetry is a kind of philosophy. This refers to um, uh, Rorty's title, um, Philosophy as a Kind of Writing, his um, earliest essay on, on Derrida. And it is for Richard Rorty. He was an exceptionally nice, kind, tolerant, generous, and uh, altogether um, agreeable human being. And so uh, any sort of hints of ad hominem argument here, are, I hope they won't be taken that way. So. Hope you won't take it as a backhand kind of compliment, or something even worse, like old score settling, if I try to find some way to talk our issues through in verse. At best, it might be something that combined word magic with your talent to rehearse dilemmas in philosophy of mind, language, or logic, and yet intersperse the expert stuff with writing of the sort that takes a larger readership on board and never sells them or its topic short. The reason was, your prose style could afford to mingle idioms like modes of thought, unworried as to how they might accord with the strict protocols set up to thwart such ventures into regions unexplored by the rule sticklers. Yet, it might be said, why rhyme and meter when you stuck to prose, albeit of a kind that's likely read more often by non-specialists than those whose academic caution bids them tread a style path narrower than the one you chose as the best route for anyone who'd head off on a, a high ground hike that might disclose perspectives on the intellectual scene, unglimpsed and unimagined from inside the mind world of philosophers who've been trained on the low road and thereafter tried to take short views. But that's not what you mean, not rhyme and meter, when you set aside the plain prose indicators of routine guild membership or signs of bona fide professional allegiance and advise your colleagues in the academic game that, everything considered, they'd be wise to give up warming over all the same old chestnuts in a slightly different guise, or seeking out new idioms to frame the fixed agenda of an enterprise well past its prime. Then theirs would be the aim of coming up with such inventive tropes, such metaphors or narratives, as might, if not too late, 
redeem the lost life hopes of those who'd suffered the perennial blight brought on by being forced to learn the ropes as tenure track required. So they should write not just, you said, the sort of prose that copes with getting the main points across in tight, well-structured form, but prose that tried to do what poets and some novelists do best, that is, discover senses to pursue far out beyond the denotations stressed by all the hard-nosed literalists. They eschew such verbal license since it fails the test of making sense or coming out as true according to the strictest standards pressed so hard on other language games by just those house-trained intellects who had brought about the trahison des clercs, or breach of trust, by which philosophers presume to flout the rule that says all living language must transform itself by always trying out fresh metaphors to live by. So, the thrust of how you wrote was mainly to cast doubt on the old kinds of metaphor that held philosophy in their Cartesian grip, or classic narratives whose upshot spelled the moral that each ephebe be a chip off the old block and strike a pose that quelled all notions of creative authorship by a strict etiquette whose code compelled unruly types to give their guide the slip each time they fancied penning the odd phrase where some non-standard idiom revealed thoughts out of kilter with such proper ways of monologic speech. What lay concealed, you let us know, in such communiques between the lines from somewhere out left field, was everything suppressed by the malaise of a style degree zero that appealed only to those in whom the wonder-struck Thalmazine, where philosophy began for Socrates, has somehow come unstuck and left them, tenure seekers to a man, resolved that prose of theirs should have no truck with poetry. They upheld Plato's ban on metaphor and mimesis, and what luck or inspiration offered to the clan of rhapsodes and enthusiasts, so lost in their wild world intoxicating state as to allow no reckoning of its cost to reason the soul, or pause to estimate the civic harms poetically glossed as due to gods or muses. Still, you'd rate this first epistle evidence of crossed wires or cross purposes, since to equate your idea that philosophy should take a more poetic form with the idea that rhyme and meter might between them make some big improvement seems a case of clear misapprehension. What you thought would break the spirit-wasting rule of that austere style without style and maybe help to shake the sense that went along with it of sheer necessity that certain things be done in certain ways as laid down by the code for normal practices mandated none of those verse features that might grace an ode by Pindar, Keats, or co, and co, but that you'd shun, I guess, if they turned up as here, bestowed on writing of a kind that shouldn't run to formal structures, apt to overload the powers of concentration rightly trained, by readers of a less indulgent bent, on more substantive issues. Point sustained. You still found room for reasoned argument, not least while telling us what's to be gained by taking on the freedom to invent new language games beyond the sorts ordained by fealty to some one line of dissent against all others. So we'd better think that when you told us poetry could save philosophy or pull it from the brink of a not undeserved nor early grave, the price of having its choice public shrink to minuscule proportions, this meant they've gone wrong, the current lot, in ways that link way back to many another short-lived wave of intellectual fashion. They should learn more from the poets about how to spin fresh-minted metaphors, or how to turn a life-enhancing phrase, but not begin on any verse-led binge that bids us spurn all remnants of analysis and pin our best hopes to those language games that yearn for something more upliftingly akin to that which rhyme and meter put in place of dullard reason. So let's not deny the obvious. When you suggest we face philosophy's low prospects with an eye to poetry's high hopes, it's not the case that you're just asking us to versify the same old topics. What you want's more space between the words so language can supply the poetry that comes of hearing all the intertextual echoes that resound on cue to every signifier's call, or sundry connotations that surround each letter, word, and phrase when not in thrall to denotative sense, but, as you found with Derrida's best efforts to forestall the dead hand of the literal, unbound from signified or referent. Thus freed, it takes the less thought-trodden path 
that winds along whichever language route may lead the denker, like the dichter, past what binds the intellect to some accustomed creed or idiolect to usage. For those minds professionally groomed to meet the need that intellect conform to just the kinds of usage certified to hold the line against such vagrant thoughts. That's why you waged ironic war on readings that, like mine, took Derrida as one who still engaged with topics that the Derrida guard define as squarely philosophical, since staged in just such terms as those that you'd consigned to the scrap heap of words that once assuaged our craving for God's substitutes, but now must join the pile along with other such time-honored relics. These remind us how hard we shall find it to escape the clutch of outworn images or disavow Pythagorean echoes that still touch some chord in us, despite what we allow to be their hollow ring. The case was much the same, your point again, throughout the whole unquestionably rich and varied tale of Western metaphysics, and the role within it of those metaphors whose trail leads back to the idea of mind or soul as glassy essence. This would then entail the message that philosophy's main goal must be to see that clarity prevail, mind apprehend that essence, and soul come by constant mirror polishing to catch its own reflection unimpaired by some small imperfection or minutest scratch that might obstruct its gaze. Your rule of thumb with metaphors like this was mix and match them as a poet might till they succumb to ordinary usage, then dispatch them to whatever limbo is set apart for tropes, as Nietzsche said, that masquerade as concepts. Whence the counterfeit as art, amongst philosophers of stock in trade, of unremembering, as if by heart, those pre-Socratic metaphors that made philosophy from Plato to Descartes, and in our time, a dismal dress parade of tropes now blanched anemic by the shift from sensuous to abstract. This made sure their advent as imagination's gift to thought was long forgotten and secure from prying intellects that gave short shrift to white mythologies in quest of pure conceptual instruments by which to lift themselves above the thought-distracting lure of sensuous imagery and so attain transcendent truths. Thus far, one might agree and think you'd hit bang on a major strain of chronic self-delusion that might be put out of its long post-Cartesian pain by the shrewd mix of gentle mockery and counterstatement that you hoped would gain more converts than if tendered in a key of odium scholasticum that left the opposition dug in deeper while its case, however strong, appeared bereft of basic courtesies that civil style and decency should couple with the heft of a good argument. The point that I'll raise once again, since, despite all your deft rejoinders, it's the one I have on file under unfinished business, is your use of that word transcendental to include not only fictive entities like noose, soul, spirit, mind, and the whole abstract brood they fathered, mainly as a poor excuse to smuggle God back in, but things that you would deem just as bad, like all claims to deduce from certain basic principles construed as a priori warranted, or backed by reasonings in a transcendental form, such truths as otherwise we should have lacked the means to justify. This was a norm, you thought, that held up merely through the fact that dumping it would kick up such a storm amongst philosophers who'd made their pact to play along that, sti to play along that sticking with the swarm seemed, on the face of it, a better bet than opting out of their protective guild, unlearning all the codes and passwords set for members, counselling thought routines instilled through years of work, and striving to forget the job security that came with skilled observance of the local etiquette. Such were the benefits, if one fulfilled conditions on sound uses, of such big load-bearing terms as transcendental, which, if downed in your way with a hefty swig of irony, say you're about to ditch the whole caboodle and help that lot twig how they've been taken in. The only hitch with this fine plan of yours was how to rig the grand exposure so as not to stitch the whole the thing up so completely that there's no room left for anything remotely like the discipline you practiced years ago. One that, an observation apt to strike shrewd readers, still engaged you even though you came to treat its bimillennial Reich as more a kind of vaudeville roadshow with some enticing bits put in to spike the guns of those who'd say, Let's just call time on the whole thing, 
cut funding where it hurts, and block philosophy's attempt to mime the natural sciences. Your view converts to a slight variant on this paradigm, and, though you'd balk at this, distinctly flirts with end-of-history wonks who make a prime intent of rubbishing what disconcerts the currency of plain old common sense, for which read ideology, and try to rouse the populace in its defense by methods that more fittingly apply in contexts where the arguments dispense with any show of reason. A far cry from the plain pragmatism you condense in Jamesian style as wanting to get by on a truth notion that at last comes down to what's good as a matter of belief, or what works out as the best game in town with good and best, defined, to keep it brief, as tending by whatever means to crown our efforts with success, or bring relief at other times when fortune seems to frown on our endeavours. Or, for you a chief plus point, it fits in with the pragmatist's desire to keep our truth talk within reach of practicalities too soon dismissed by those like Kant, who much prefer to preach from the high moral ground, and so enlist some abstract universal rule for each new case in hand, which then becomes more grist to the deontic mill, where every breach of its strict regulations either throws a case-shaped spanner in the works, or churns out some case-crushing judgment to impose its sovereign law. Agreed, your thinking earns high marks in this department, since it goes some way toward showing what the Kantian learns, if ever, then most often at the close of a rule-governed moral life that turns out, with the unaccustomed gift of long-range reckoning, to exhibit all the signs of having gone life-damagingly wrong, whenever force of circumstance confines the range of choice to seizing either prong of some dilemma, where instinct inclines to kindly acts and answers like a gong at nature's call, while reason undermines all that, decrees that precept substitute for practice, and demands that instinct grant law's reason-based imperative to suit mere inclination to its rule, as Kant sadistically enjoined. Such absolute conceptions of the moral good got scant respect from you since lying at the root of all bad creeds, whose technique is to plant abstraction in the place where those to whom such thoughts appeal had better cultivate breadth of acquaintance as advised by Hume, make reason slave to passion, and sedate through social intercourse the will to doom all absolutes but theirs to the same fate reserved for infidels by tribes with room for no gods but their own. At any rate, your laid-back style does nothing to promote such sermonizing, and reminds us, when we're tempted by it, of how well you wrote about the need to stand back, now and then, from our most cherished values, and devote some uptime to imagining again, like a good novelist, how to keep afloat in these high seas. The finest of them pen inventive variations on the way your liberal ironist might come to view the issue from all sides, and not betray that purpose by a sneaky will to skew the moral compass points and so convey home truths as universal. Still, if you think back a bit, you'll know I've kept at bay a bunch of issues that ensured we too were seldom in accord, beyond what I've set out as motivation just enough for my verse-aided efforts to contrive this late rapprochement. Where the seas got rough on previous trips was when we took a dive into that choppy transcendental stuff, and you said that the best way to survive the maelstrom was to call Poseidon's bluff, go with the flow, and take it all in stride, as pragmatists commend, by holding fast to something large and light enough to ride the storm out, empty barrel, chunk of marsh, your choice, since centrifuged out to the side and buoyed up high as all the rest stream past, then corkscrewed down. Most likely I've applied this metaphor in ways that must be classed, pedestrian or frankly bottom grade, for creativity, when set against the scale you draw up as a reader's aid for sorting texts conservatively fenced around with the exclusion signs displayed by faithful exegetes, from texts that sensed quite other possibilities but strayed only so far, then texts that dispensed with the whole rule book. This served just to vex free spirits, poets, critics, novelists, philosophers, all those who long to flex creative muscles, since the book insists they not relax the standard range of checks that help to straighten out the teasing twists of connotation that can so perplex plain readers. 
It's the transcendentalist gene sequence in your DNA, I guess, that evokes Blake and Wordsworth, maybe Keats, with Shelley, Byron, and by more or less predestined westward passage, what completes their project in the visionary sagesse of Emerson and Thoreau, then retreats, if that's the word, to a downtown address in pragmatism's stroller-friendly streets. That's the backstory that has most to tell about the two ways transcendental went. The Kantian way, that cast its lingering spell on each new cohort in the regiment of armchair ruminants, whom it befell like Noah's curse. The other, what you meant by telling us they go together well, the canny pragmatist, and those whose bent runs more to the imaginative heights of a sublime whose transcendental modes would stretch the power of reason that unites our faculties until the strain explodes their fragile links. Yet, in its highest flights of streamlined uplift, still the mind bears loads that keep it tending earthward, since, by rights, its journey's end is that of all the roads you said converged on the one truth-shaped thing worth seeking. This was how to keep the charm of fantasy alive, and maybe bring its wish to pass, yet let it not do harm, as you thought every fine utopian fling so far had done, and thus help to rearm the thought crusade of those who sought to swing op opinion round by sounding the alarm and tarring liberals with McCarthy's brush. The trouble is, this fell in all too pat with something very like that same old rush to judgment, and too comfortably sat with what you took as freedom's cause. It's a push, if not all things American, then that transcendent form of them that, at first blush, might seem a fine thing to be aiming at, yet loses something of its first appeal when thoughts of all that's happened in the name of those high sentiments begin to steal upon us and suggest that we reframe our notions of how real world and ideal should properly relate. Then what's to blame, in large part, for the regular raw deal inflicted on the losers in this game, misfits or rogue states, is that very knack of managing to mix the highest toned professions of intent with a laid back or downright cynic outlook that condoned as fit for it to find purposes a stack of wrongs home and abroad that you disowned only in passing. It's that curious lack of joined up thought by which a double zoned Weltanschauung, the transcendental linked with a pragmatic view of things that veered at times way off the moral path and winked at motes and beams alike, adroitly cleared its conscience, though the issues stood distinct by a well-practiced trick of thought that steered a zigzag course from high to low and blinked at just the moments when its pilot feared too close a view of what might else have posed a real and present danger to its hard-won sense of certain moral truths disclosed only to some choice few. The message jarred, as you found out, not just on folk disposed by hopes long disappointed to regard the holdout hopers from a viewpoint closed against them, or on those too deeply scarred by various gods that failed, but on a bunch of new left types and radicals. We shared a lot of your beliefs, but had this hunch quite early on that we should be prepared to work out why, when it came to the crunch of prime allegiance openly declared, you'd count the US bashers out to lunch and start to say more plainly that we'd erred in thinking its high beacon might be crazed or lantern poorly serviced, so that we could best do a repair job on the glazed top dome by calculating the degree to which its beams were discrepantly phased with more progressive thought. Then we might see, clean through, the ideology that dazed believers in that old land of the free type, spirit-raising stuff, cooked up to fool us into swallowing the usual lies put out by those whose most effective tool for mind manipulation in the guise of soul perfection came straight from a school where pragmatism reigned. Here the top prize went to the firmest stickler to that sticker, to that rule which said, give them the transcendental highs once in a while, and then there'd be no end to the stuff they put up with when required, or benefit of doubt they'd soon extend when principle and circumstance conspired to make sure any principle would bend as circumstance decreed. No doubt you're tired of having constantly to dodge and fend off brickbats from a bunch of leftists fired by social passions you'd have thought in tune at least on all the basic points, with your idea of how our best selves might commune in a pragmatic way that knew the score and saw small chance of any big change soon, yet still had social hopes worth living for, 
since neither prone nor yet autoimmune to disappointment. This said, don't ignore the history of failures and the sad track record, most especially, of calls for social transformation that went bad or came to naught, but rather seek what falls within the range of upgrades we can add without the plane becoming one that stalls because its rate of climb is more than a tad too rapid. Yet, if their response still galls you now, those types like me who started out your champions in the literary camp, but later found increasing room for doubt, then maybe it's because they saw the stamp of ideals turned ironically about, and so deployed first shrewdly to revamp those social hopes, then as a way to scout their proper limits, and if need be cramp their militant or rebel-raising style, by timely inculcation of the taste for solvent ironies that bid us smile with fond indulgent on that, uh, indulgence on that chronic waste of energies. All this, remember, while us lefties, whether Brits or US-based, saw their beliefs chucked on the rubbish pile by neocons who cynically embraced high-minded and hard-headed in the clinch that an old pragmatist like William James could still keep more than decent at a pinch and even turned right round against the aims of Warhawk Palliacons, men every inch the dark precursors of the bunch whose names I'll spare you now, since not a man to flinch at chronicling his nation's sins and shames along with its strong points. Let us be clear, there's nothing in the least ad hominem about the issues I've been raising here, or nothing that will please the likes of them, those analytic types who chose to sneer at your supposed apostasy, condemn your style as an affront to their austere world ha word habits, and decline a more ad rem engagement with your work. Thus, nod and wink implied that you'd now given up the sort of real tough-minded stuff they wouldn't blink at, and elected rather to hold court in the soft company of such as think philosophy is an intertextual sport, or just one more excuse for spilling ink in literary ways that won't support examination of the rigorous kind that tells which arguments have hit the mark for colleagues of an analytic mind. Thus it presents, or so they'd say, a stark memento of the world you left behind when, mid-career, you opted to embark on a more wayward course and then fly blind, since the downside of that free as a lark or giddy aerobatic stuff's to leave you looping wildly just when their technique of concept parsing might have helped retrieve terrestrial reference points by which to seek familiar landmarks. Talk like that would peeve a saint at length, so you did well to tweak their verbal dress codes now and then, or weave new styles around them, rather than critique the enterprise head-on, since then you'd just be falling back on something like the ruse, as you perceived it, that the Kantians trust as a good fallback strategy to use, either when momentarily nonplussed, or else when there's some point too big to lose, so that the game plan says, just go for bust with transcendental backup and j'accuse a stock refrain. No question, you emerge much better placed on all the tick box counts of moral decency than those who'd urge we read your work in readiness to pounce on anything that might invite the scourge applied so vigorously to denounce your every thought as teetering on the verge of continental or what this amounts to in their language game, far out beyond the intellectual pale. Thus, devotees of Kant are just as likely to respond that way as all those others prone to seize their every chance to reinforce the bond of guild-endorsed philosophers and squeeze out all such dwellers in the demi-monde of disrepute. Thus, hard-won expertise, like theirs, sells at a discount, while the price of shares in Continentals, Inc., is chalked sky high and sure to double in a trice, they grumble, when some current fad gets talked up in a hybrid style that lets you splice the chat with old philosophemes that stalked mines corridors, till Occam's fine device henceforth ensured that all sound thinkers balked at such scholastic garbage. Let's accept that they were wrong, that you were far from sold on all things continental, that you kept close ties within the analytic fold, and above all, that you are too adept at finding subtler ways to break the mold than to wish their whole culture might be swept aside and so give them good cause to scold your Jacobin designs. Then there's the deep and not just anecdotal link between the various sides of you that often leap together off the page, the sense of keen yet gentle irony, the will to keep all aspects of the intellectual scene somewhere in view, 
The scintillating sweep of Idee and Geschichte that could glean so much from a review of past ideas like Hegel naturalized, and the belief that we do best to hold a course that steers as far as can be from the moral reef marked cruelty. Add to them your two cheers for reason outlook that takes half a leaf from Hume's congenial book, and then the fears that thought too closely tied to the motif of sovereign truth might readily be pressed into official service by some grand inquisitor whose idea of the test for truthfulness will certainly not stand a moment's scrutiny against the best of your unholy virtues. This I planned to bring out all along, but then, you guessed, the argument got somewhat out of hand, or more like, tended to revert to type and restage quarrels that are running still in quarters where they've not absorbed the hype about how everyone's now had their fill of truth talk and forgotten the old gripe that Socrates once aimed at those whose skill in speaking well enabled them to pipe such pleasing tunes that they subdued the will to truth in their rapt auditors. It's more, for me, the snag that comes up every time we want to find some intimate rapport, some near equivalent of perfect rhyme, between a thinker's predilection for the one thought ladder that could help them climb above their own life indurated store of prejudices, and the point that I am now keen to make, in case I've seemed to pick too many bones, all those integral traits of mind and character, what made you tick, in short, which present orthodoxy states may have their proper role in any thick description or biography that rates them on their proven tendency to click with readers, but which protocol dictates should count for nothing more. The only place you really take a line on this is where you talk about a different sort of case, flat contrary to yours, and say that there can be no valid reason to embrace a creed that has a solemnly declare, as touching on the amply vouched disgrace, political and moral, of one Herr Professor Heidegger, the need to take account of man and work viewed in the round, and therefore not permit ourselves to make exceptions from the rule for such renowned philosophers, if only for the sake of hanging on to some last common ground where intellect and ethics hope to stake their claim of being each to other bound in virtue's cause. You didn't go for that high-minded, but you thought misguided brand of earnest moralizing, since the flat refusal among some to understand how great minds might just not know where it's at, ethically speaking, or have morals and behavior like those of an alley cat, was too apt to promote the sort of bland consensual thinking, currently the most depressing trademark of a discipline that raised conformity to a high boast and used group feeling as its means to pin a steer well clear of this one sign, or post a keep off notice, then proceed to bin the offending work. For readers overdosed on warnings, you advised, give, us, uh, give it a spin, give them a hearing and allow, since it's now pretty much beyond dispute, that there's another label that quite aptly fits the thinker in whose work the Logos shares deep truths unplumbed by all the sharpest wits from Plato down, and that's the one he bears in your phrase, Schwarzwald Redneck. So the bits in Heidegger worth saving for the heirs of Western metaphysics can be cut and pasted so as to produce a script less vibrant with the call of being, but much likelier to chime with those who've skipped a lot of that historic stuff and shut the book on Dasein's epic. What this stripped down version also skimps is how the hut he famously hung out in, though equipped with stove and other basics, put across the same old tale incessantly rehearsed throughout his lucubrations on the loss of truth's authentic voice, as in the worst of those texts that the faithful try to gloss as aberrations, but which readers versed in his life history won't be apt to toss so quickly out of court. Granted, my first intention here, remember, was to press, despite your offstage ironies, the need that thinking hold its nerve and not regress to the idea that arguments succeed by suasive force alone, since what's success, you might ask, if not getting folk agreed to see th seeing things our way, or that answering yes, that notion fits in very well indeed with my belief set, adds up to a good or halfway adequate account of what most rightly is or should be understood when words like truth or knowledge fill a slot that best belief won't fill. I said it would be better for philosophy and not just so as to provide a livelihood or timely academic booster shot for tired philosophers, 
If it hung on to the most basic item in the stock of brand name goods you thought had long since gone the way of all such woefully ad hoc contrivances or strategies to con the laggards into putting up a mock display of expertise whereby to don the robes of science. This means, parche lock, still searching for some last sine qua known of true philosophy, that is, the mode of transcendental reasoning that alone, or so its adepts claim, affords a road to a priori truths that can be known for sure and quite aside from knowledge owed to mere sense certainty. Although we've grown suspicious of ideas like this that load, as you'd say, such a deal of otiose conceptual baggage on the heaven hook left dangling from the days of grandiose high-flying metaphysics, still the book may not be shut or epilogue be close in that long thought adventure that it took for Geist to bid a first brave adios to myth, or criticism cock a snook at custom-bound belief. I'd say that we have a middle course to steer that won't just tip this way or that and resolutely cleave to honest Uncle Kant or simply flip like you the other way, resolve to heave that stuff clean overboard and thereby clip Sientia's wings. That is, we best conceive some way that reason can retain its grip on our beliefs, yet so as not to yield straight off to the assorted booby traps you laid down for it, come prepare to wield the kind of argument that fills the gaps in any concept system vacuum sealed on a priori grounds against the lapse of knowledge with the sorts of truth revealed by opting to revise the mental maps that drew such clear-cut demarcation lines between the twin imperia of Hume's matter of fact and truths of reason. Mine's not the conclusion everyone assumes must follow if one takes the force of Quine's two dogmas as an argument that dooms all such distinctions, or that undermines thought's last defence against the threat that looms, although of course you'd find the claim absurd, when the whole question as to what's a sound or reputable case fit to be heard and acted on, and what's with justice found deficient on that count, goes by the word of those best placed to put the word around among those likewise placed. So it gets blurred, the precept most philosophers felt bound to honour until recently, that truth may come apart from any of its near or not so near replacement terms for soothsaying generally, or lest this appear a choice of phrase, or offensive or uncouth, those sundry substitutes for the idea of truth sans phrase. These, the Sherlockian sleuth, were deemed effective, since designed to steer far wide of any thought that truth, defined as best belief, or even as what stands at journey's end for those brave souls inclined to seek it, cannot all the same join hands with truth in the objective sense assigned to word and concept by the strict demands of those whose compasses remain aligned with true magnetic north and point to lands as yet unreachable by any routes marked on our atlases. So there's the nub of all I've said, that this, like most disputes, that periodically disturb the club of old philosophy's newfound recruits, is one where both belligerents could rub along quite well if those false absolutes, like truth and reason, that you'd have a scrub from our vocabularies, don't reside above, beyond, or in a realm remote from the mundane contingencies you tried to make us see were all that underwrote the shape and meaning that events supplied, to lives whose genre was the anecdote, not grand récit, and whose narrators vied one with another, not just to promote their own brand truths, but more in hope to lend a new spin to the old roman a fleuve of braided storylines. This then might bend the talk toward new topics that could serve at last to knock away all those dead-end delusion props that help supply the nerve for spirit's age-old hankering to transcend necessity's iron grip without the swerve of hooked Lucretian atoms whose slight nudge this way or that did nothing to assuage such all too human yearnings. Though you judge it merely a reversion to the stage of Kantian tutelage or a hopeless fudge, still we need some thought instrument to gauge just what philosophy can do to budge our stubborn preconceptions or engage creatively yet critically with ways of storytelling that may strike a chord so sympathetic as to gain straight A's from everyone or get them all on board and yet by some unlooked for turn of phrase or stray plot detail show how they'd ignored the one thing that, when hit upon, betrays how many of the reasons why it's scored so high in their joint estimation, came down chiefly to group pressure, plus a touch of wishful thinking 
and the need to frame a tale around all this that bears no such unwelcome implications as to shame our better selves. No doubt we'll often clutch at straws or straw poles so as to disclaim all thought of leaning on the feeble crutch of self-reliance that the poor old moi essable uses to fend off the jibes aimed at it by the crowd whose guiding star is one whose kindly light gives back the tribe's own predilections, whether such as are reliably adjusted to the vibes of a whole culture and its thought bizarre, or else the sort the specialist imbibes, once they're inducted by all the techniques of guild recruitment you expose to view as an ex-member, into various cliques or expert subdivisions like the crew of trained philosophers. Yet this bespeaks another requisite that maybe you don't emphasize enough, that any tweaks to their consensus not go in for too much talk of how philosophies run its course, run out of steam, drained all its rivers dry and so forth, since that might seem to endorse a narrative denouement that would fly clean in the face of your big plan to force or better yet persuade, that lot to try some way around the Guild-approved divorce between what lets the tenured types get by with least risk and what lets those with a yen for certain riskier, more inventive kinds of writing do their thing. Then they can pen texts of the sort no rule of genre binds, or no such rule as served, time and again, to house train undomesticated minds and save them from their own devices when some telltale touch of metaphor yet finds their weakness out. That's how you seem to treat the two types as flat opposite, as if inventiveness were something so offbeat, so apt to run a syncopating riff on thoughts for in a bar, that a complete exclusion rule, or else another tiff like Plato's with the Rhapsode, must defeat all efforts to remove the lingering whiff of scandal that attaches to topoi such as, think Nietzsche Derrida, the role of figural devices they employ, those concept frontiers men, whilst on patrol to make sure nothing like the fate of Troy befall philosophy should that old mole, horse-shaped or metaphoric, redeploy within its city limits. What this whole verse colloquy has tried to do is state the case, I hope not too perverse a slant on things, but all your arguments relate both ways, that is, to concepts that transplant by metaphoric means or conjugate poetically, and metaphors that can't be subject to exchange at some low rate, determined by our willingness to grant poetic license. Curious, then, that it's avowedly your one great aim to coax us off all versions of the creed that splits apart the unity our mind evokes, when not compelled to test its native wits against the thought predicament that pokes up only if the intellect permits itself to perpetrate a crafty hoax of just that sort. I trust your genial shade won't take it ill that I've seen fit to nag once more at issues you'd hoped to persuade us we'd do best at this late stage to tag cut price old stock, or just allow to fade from view like those, as Hegel said, that lag behind the zeitgeist in a dull parade called by the Owl of Minova to drag out their sad afterlives. Then there's the now far off yet vivid memory of a walk with you round Monticello, and of how, predictably enough perhaps, the talk turned toward Jefferson, no sacred cow for you, but better than the tales they hawk about him currently, his splendid vow against all tyrants, and where our paths fork, now as back then, your faith, that seems an apt word here, that our America, though yet to be achieved, was the sole nation mapped by dream cartographers with compass set for gorgeous palaces and towers cloud-capped, to me a baseless fabric, though a threat should it materialize beyond such rapt imagining, to you the unpaid debt thought owes to hope. Truth is, although I try to sort out man from work, or get a fix on how far hopes like that may underlie, let's not say undermine, the various tricks of your old trade you'd later reapply to non-trade purposes, the effort sticks each time around at the same point, where I can't manage to disintricate the mix of reasons, motives, causes, temperament, and class. Then factor in the side effects of US academe on one whose bent ran counter, and what any eye detects in Trotsky and wild orchids, as intent to make amends as well as pay respect, to him your father activist who'd spent his life, a self-reproach your peace deflects but can't quite lay to rest, 
in ways that went to further emphasize the disconnects so keenly felt in yours. Yet you present as well a case for writing that neglects, on its own time, that duty to augment the public good and privately directs its energies to helping us invent new styles of self-description that the sects may do with as they wish. But since you've lent my verse a lot more time than it, than it expects, best if you now let go, or circumvent, your favoured term, these issues one suspects you never had much time for, and content my quibbling soul with all that interjects to conjure up the rorty text event as kindliest of modern grapholects. And that's it. Thank you.